These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. We are now squarely into the late Old Babylonian period. This historical era is characterized by quite a bit happening, though very little seems to actually change, at least within the borders of Babylonia itself. Babylon and its major cities are prosperous, but a great deal of royal attention is shifted inwards, to the capital city itself. Now, this was surely a great thing for the people of Babylon, but it is a spot of difficulty for historians, since the old city of Babylon, the one which would have been built up in this century, was washed away when the Euphrates River shifted course 200 years from now, and much of what was left will be built over by successive generations more concerned with their own glory than the ruins of previous dynasties which is all a fancy way of saying that we're going to be covering quite a lot of ground today because there's quite a lot we don't have too much detail on. We hit the ground running in 1712 with the death of Samsu Ilana and the ascension of his son Abiyashu. In a sense, very little is changing here, for just as Samsu Ilana was very much of the same temperament as his father had been, so too does Abiyashu seem to be cast in the same mold. He was focused on the prosperity of the empire, the worship of the gods, and the execution of justice, but was aggressive enough at the same time to keep the empire's borders pretty close to how his father had left them for him. In his very first full regnal year, he issues a Masharam edict, which by now has become something of an expected part of succession, annulling certain categories of debts and freeing some debt slaves. Like the rest of his dynasty, he positions himself as a champion of justice, and while we have no surviving records of him directly involved in jurisprudence, there is a fair amount of surviving court documents for all the successors of Hammurabi, including the court cases discussed last episode, which show that the administration of Babylonian justice remained a priority for the later kings. Still, not all was peaceful. The Kassites had never really gone away after their military defeat, and they should not be thought of as like a unified whole. Some Kassites were defeated by Samsu Ilana 20 years ago, but many others had just moved in, nomad style, and were living more or less peacefully next to civilization, and sometimes even starting to integrate into civilization. And at the same time as many Kassites were living peacefully, a tribe or group of tribes decided that it was time for round two against Babylon, a campaign which Abiyashu and his generals, having had a generation to familiarize themselves with Kassite culture and tactics, was able to put down solidly in his fourth year. But just as one trouble is taken care of, another arises. The Elamites in the east, apparently fairly strong at the moment, also want to test Abiyashu and launch a raid into Babylonian territory. Abiyashu claims a victory here, but by some accounts, 30 cities may have been sacked and a number of holy treasures were taken away back to Elam. So while Babylon itself remained safe from both of these threats, the east side of the empire was hit pretty hard. And we have accounts of people fleeing the area under the protection of a general, Manam Kima Shamash, who was apparently in charge of protecting a herd of evacuees. This could have been bad, the start of a major collapse. But the great gods smiled on Abiyashu and sent him no more than he could handle. No rebellions sprang up in the wake of these consecutive raids and no more external enemies piled on. The next year, Abiyashu returned to the quiet prosperity that characterized much of the era, creating a ceremonial mace for Marduk's temple and some glowing statues. The next year, he dedicates a great temple to the moon goddess Sin in Babylon. Of course, even at peace, he's still locked in a cold conflict with his Sealand neighbor to the south. Over the next decade, he demonstrates that he is a worthy successor to his grandfather's towering intellect by initiating a set of passive-aggressive public works projects aimed at starving out his southern enemy. 
Around 1704, he ordered Doug a great new canal off the Tigris to divert a large chunk of the Eastern River into the Euphrates Basin. This helped keep water levels high in Babylon and his core cities, all clustered around branches of the Euphrates, and may have been hydrologically disastrous to the marshlands downstream. It may not have been immediately obvious to the people of the south that a portion of their own poverty was being caused by heavy usage and river diverting in Babylonia. And in the years they took to realize what was going on, a new set of forts on the Tigris to protect this channel bearing Abiash's name had been constructed. With the forts in place to protect the river, the next phase in the plan was to dam the Tigris River completely and divert the entire watercourse to the Euphrates. The oracles were consulted and the gods gave their consent, and the people went to work blocking off an entire river. If the Sealand dynasty had any idea what was going on to their north, however, they made no more than token attempts to stop it. This may be because the forts of Dur Abi Ashur were fairly formidable obstacles, based on the records that have survived from them. This fort tells us nothing about any military actions, just that Abi Ashur was ready on the defense. But what it does have is a fascinating historical detail. Right around the year 1700 BCE, we have a number of accounting records and muster lists from the fort, which tell us that fair-sized detachments of Kassites had been brought into the Babylonian military, and with them had come the first confirmation of horses being used in warfare in Mesopotamia. We speculate that the previous Kassite invasions used horses, but there is no actual record of it until now. It will be slow going, but the Kassites and the horse are going to be major players in our story for quite a while. With all the Tigris blocked off and much of the Euphrates consumed and diverted away, the people of the Southlands were undoubtedly struggling. But even this was not the ultimate end goal of Abi Ashu, just a fortunate weakening of the enemy that had stolen the southern chunk of his father's empire. Abiyashu's ultimate goal was announced very publicly. He intended to drain the swamps and capture Iluma'ili, the king of Sealand. You see, the professional Babylonian military was sensibly wary of the hazards of operating in force inside marshland, and this was a remarkable stroke of vision for Abiyashu, or for whichever advisor originally proposed drying out Sealand. And it must have worked to an extent, since at the southern forts we have records of a noticeable number of defectors from the Sealand army joining up with the Babylonians in exchange for food. But Abiyashu would wait, and he would watch, and he would receive regular reports on the water levels in the southern marshes. But after probably a bit of initial drying out, Abiyashu came to learn that the marshlands were fed in part by the Persian Gulf, and would never recede in his lifetime. If he wanted Ilima Ilu, he would have to march into the hostile swamp and pull him out the hard way, and impoverished Sumer simply wasn't worth that cost in lives or treasure. The only real prize in the South, aside from the glory of ruling the ancient cradle of civilization, was the fading religious center of Nippur already mostly replaced by the temples of Babylon, and it was taken almost incidentally thanks to Babylonian control of the waterways into the much diminished city. And so the border between Babylon and Sealand would end up slightly more fortified than it had begun, but eventually the Tigris would be allowed to run its course again, and relations between the two states would settle back into a wary caution. We have, for the most part, already seen what occupied most of Abiyashu's reign, apart from these few military adventures, when we discussed the culture and economy of Babylon during both Hammurabi and Samsu Ilana's reign. Abiyashu built things, and his people flourished. His borders shifted very little, being defined more or less by the fortress up the Euphrates north of Turka, the fortress in the middle of the Diyala River Valley by the Tigris, and the southern line with Sealand. He had inherited most of these forts from his father, and he would be passing them on in turn to his son, Ami Saduka. <laughs>
There was one more minor campaign, one that we can't date precisely, in the Diyala River against the remnants of Eshnunna, who were living just outside the Babylonian border, and ended in the capture of their obscure king. But aside from the people directly affected by it, it seems to have had little lasting consequences. Abiyashu would pass from the mortal realm in 1684 BCE, after 28 years of rule, and be replaced by another son, Amiditana, who was cast in much the same mold as his father. He, too, began his rule with a Masharim edict, cancelling debts, and spent nearly his entire time on the throne building things and fostering the general prosperity of Babylon. Though there isn't much we can say in particular about his reign, my own guess is that after a century of general peace and good fortune, it is the very quiet 47 years of his kingship that were the absolute best time for a man of Babylon to be alive. Like his father, he constructed fortresses to reinforce the existing borders rather than expand them, and the low-level conflict with Sealand in the south continued. These fort records do have a small historical note of interest. In one minor and ultimately inconsequential skirmish with the Southerners, both sides are recorded as bringing horse-drawn chariots into the battle, meaning that now, by 1670, this new and terrifying weapon has been integrated into the arsenal of every major player and will be present on every major battlefield for the rest of our story. Aside from low-level skirmishes, the extremely long reign of Amiditana has had only one military engagement large enough to get a year name for it. In the mid-1660s, Amiditana, with the great strength of Shamash and Marduk, seized Yara Abbey, the man of the land. It isn't even clear that this was a battle, since it's a very odd way to formulate a war victory. We also have no idea who this fellow is, and while the general assumption is that he was some sort of tribal chief, there's also the possibility that this was simply a large manhunt against a very high-profile criminal or enemy of the state. Whatever the truth of it was, the incident is mentioned only once, and we know nothing at all about the details. That said, Amiditana's reign is somewhat poorly documented, but we do have records from a number of military locations, like forts, that would presumably have been on the front lines of any battles. The absence of any indication of conflict, either here or in the cities that have been excavated, isn't definitive proof that there was general peace in the land, but it does give us the idea that Amiditana's reign may well have been among the most peaceful half-centuries in all of Mesopotamian history, continuing right on down to the present day. Which gives us very little to talk about. He dug canals, he administered justice, and he patronized the temples. He neither gained nor lost any territory, and most of what he built has since been lost to the ravages of time. Amiditana wasn't famous, displayed no great ambition or spark of exceptional genius, but he ruled over peace and preserved justice and order within his kingdom. And I feel like men of his caliber are in their own way more praiseworthy than the great conquerors who typically hog the historical spotlight. So let's all take a moment to consider good old Amiditana. You may not be well remembered, but you are remembered fondly. Please accept my congratulations in whatever afterlife you found yourself in. After 47 peaceful years, we reach the final great king of old Babylon, Ami Sadduka. His reign, I can quite confidently say, begins in the year 1646 BCE. Until now, all of the dates that I've given you have been very much approximations, with certain amounts of error possible in either direction. However, with the reign of Ami Sadduka, we have the first surviving tablet of the fledgling science of Babylonian astronomy the first documented proof that anyone in the world was looking at anything but the sun and the moon in a regular scientific fashion. These are the Venus tablets of Ami Sadduka, a set of clay tablets that each year records the dates in that year that the planet Venus transitions from being visible in the morning to being visible in the evening, over the 21 years of Ami Sadduka's reign. 
the tablets themselves do not explain why anyone was recording this, and they seem to be regular enough that there likely existed similar projects that are now lost for previous kings, though this sort of astronomical record keeping is still likely fairly new, generally speaking. The purpose can sound to some to be religious, or even mystical, and this is one part of the very long genesis of astrology, which will fully bloom some 800 years from now. But the truth is that it's a very scientific endeavor, at least in a certain sense. You see, during the old Babylonian period, priests kept records of major events, some that occurred in nature and some which occurred in the heavens, like eclipses and the movements of Venus. And someone appears to have had the idea that if they started correlating these observational records with things which occurred in the human world, then they could scientifically deduce which movements in the heavens foretold what sorts of human events. An empirical and observational endeavor that was, in spirit, quite like what many of us would consider science. Regardless of the efficacy of this earliest astrology, it clearly represents an interest in observational studies and empiricism, the first such for which evidence has survived to, to the modern day, making the Venus tablets of Ami Saduka the oldest attempt at proper science known to history. Of course, this doesn't make them uncontroversial and I may have overstated a bit the confidence with which we can read these tablets. Since they show us observational records of the location of a key planet in the night sky, we can use modern astronomy to match these tablets to a particular year, the oldest clearly objective reference point in Mesopotamian history. Unfortunately, because the 12th 13th and 21st years are all in various ways controversial, depending on how you interpret it, they could well match four separate years, 1702, 1646, 1582, and 1550. The details on this now are crazy intricate, and the debate runs from literary mentions of darkness in poetic works to dendrite densities in ancient trees, to astronomical estimates of the rate at which the Earth's rotation is slowing. It's a deep and probably fascinating rabbit hole which I have far too much going on in my life to pursue, and so I've gone for this entire show with what's called the middle chronology, in which events are dated by counting reigns and year names from this particular reference point, in which the reign of Ami Saduka begins in 1646, which is a process full of its own uncertainties. As we move forward in time into later eras, we'll get more reference points to reinforce and solidify our dates. But just remember that every time I give a firm number on this show, there is nearly always much more uncertainty that I'm letting on. Still, it's now the year 1646, or at least the year we are calling 1646. And not only are Ami Saduka's scribes getting to work on the new Venus tablets, but also he, like his predecessors, instituted a kingdom-wide debt cancellation, or Masharam Edict, which is most remarkable because we actually have the text of the edict itself, giving us a window into what these debt cancellations looked like in actual practice, as well as telling us about the project of law, as it had continued more than a century after the great lawgiver himself carved his famous code. The first thing we see, in provision one of a text that is largely without rhetorical flourishes, is that the very first order of the king is that this tablet be read out all across the country. We can only assume this was common for major royal edicts, for how else would most of the people have known what's going on? But it's interesting to see it confirmed that some agents of the government were ordered to physically go around and orally proclaim the edict to the general public. The next provision is not a general clearance of all debts. That does not happen anywhere in this edict. Rather, each section gives forgiveness to particular classes of people for particular types of debt. So first, for example, it lists farmers, shepherds, and dependents of the king and exempts them from a particular obligation called sealed notes payable, probably a particular form of taxation that they were subject to. 
The item after that exempts the people of Babylon and the Babylonian countryside, as well as some now illegible groups, from any unpaid taxes owed since the last Masharim Edict, which I didn't mention but actually occurred halfway through the reign of Amidatana. Of course, most of these would have been resolved long ago, and we see from the records that these debt-clearing edicts mostly cancel obligations only a year or two or maybe three years old. Item 4 appears to be an innovation among Masharim edicts, which in the past had forgiven only taxes owed to the government. But here, Ami Saduka announces that all interest-bearing loans owed to any Akkadian or Amorite, meaning anyone anywhere in the kingdom, not just Babylon, were cancelled. This is followed by three items that are mostly procedural. Anyone who is pressured or tricked into paying a debt early to avoid the edict or forced to pay despite the edict is eligible for a full refund or the creditor will be put to death. Later on in the document, another 15 provisions clear increasingly specific groups from particular obligations and some slaves are made eligible for release from their debt bondage. All in all, it's straightforward, easy to understand, and shows a degree of professionalism. Clearly, the king and his bureaucratic apparatus had studied past edicts and knew what parts to copy and what loopholes to preemptively close. While it wouldn't have seemed too impressive in its own time, the Edict of Ami Saduka is what happens to survive for us and represents in many ways the culmination of the long Babylonian legal project and it couldn't have come at a better time. Corruption has been creeping slowly into the fabric of Babylonian society, and hierarchies are showing signs of solidification. We're getting increasing indications in many small interactions of bribery and unfairness among government officials. The Ilkum lands, once rewards conditional on service, appear to be growing in some places into hereditary fiefs and positions in the king's ministries are increasingly handed out through nepotistic connections rather than ability. Things were still good, generally speaking, and this is a process that likely had its roots all the way back at the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. But we do get a sense of hard-to-define decline in Babylon by the reign of Ami Saduka. One side of this is the increased appearance of Kassites in our records. This would not have been a bad thing at the time, but it is a harbinger of what's to come. Kassites are now integrated into every part of Babylonian society, and probably in the communities of Sealand in the south as well, working as craftsmen, farmers, shepherds, and laborers. However, they do appear to resist integrating domestically, preferring to live in communal longhouses, either in their own quarter of the host city or even a bit outside of town. They are, for the most part, peaceful, and official records even start distinguishing between subgroups of Kassites, showing that the people running Babylon were growing increasingly familiar with how their new neighbors lived. When, in 1732, the region around Sippar is attacked by particularly aggressive nomads, the enemy is listed as the Samharites and Bitamites, rather than applying the blanket label Kassites, showing that it was now relevant to the Babylonians that some Kassites were aggressive and some were not. While it is interesting to note this brief outburst of political correctness, the attack of the Bitamites and Samharites, while fairly minor on its own, foretells the end of Babylon. Three years following this attack, something, no one is sure what, destroyed Sippar and a large number of cities north along the Euphrates, leaving a layer of burned rubble still visible in the archaeological record as far north as Haradim. Ami Saduka would manage to restore at least nominal control of the area before passing away, but in 1625 we begin a fairly sudden and largely unexplained decline in the empire that Hammurabi had built. I had said that Ami Saduka would be the last great king of Babylon, but he was not the last king to rule over it, just the last one of any quality. His son, Samsuditana, would be the first in a long line to be less than what his kingdom needed.
Now, I'm about to be pretty harsh on Sam Sultana, and I think few historians would rate him anywhere but the bottom of his dynasty. But the coming collapse may not have been entirely his fault. Every king encounters a crisis or two in his reign, but Samsudetana may well have come to power in the wake of one of the largest such crises in the ancient world, a disaster felt from Sicily to China. This was, or may have been, the explosion of the Santorini volcano, which was audible as far away as Egypt, through sulfur as far as China, and destroyed the island of Thera and the neighboring Minoan civilization so thoroughly that it would give rise to the legend of Atlantis a thousand years later. The exact date of the Santorini eruption is highly debated, with dates proposed anywhere from 1650 to 1550 BCE. But one recent paper looking at marks which were once taken as scribal errors in the Venus tablets of Ami Saduka proposed that the year 1627 may have seen Venus occluded by volcanic ash clouds only two years prior to Samsudetana's ascension to the throne. Could everything that's about to happen have been the result of the destruction of Thera? It can't be stated for certain, but it is speculated that the disruptions in Egypt and China, as well as the utter destruction of Minoan civilization, can be blamed on this event. Whether or not we think Samsudetana was competent, he may well have been playing on hard mode. For the first ten years, we hear essentially nothing. He opens up with the by now expected Musharram debt cancellation edict, quite possibly a direct copy of his father's, just with the dates changed. And in the next year, there is a peculiar year name in which Samsudetana claims the gods spoke to him, though nothing survives to tell us what the gods may have said. I hope for the king's sake that it was a warning. In year five, he wins a battle but doesn't bother to tell us who he defeated. And in year 11, cities begin to vanish from the record, one by one. First, the region north of Kish. Then, two years later, the forts of Abiyashu on the Tigris. The next year, Kish itself and Point South go dark. Whole regions fall silent in the record, not just official documentation, but contracts, private records, and letters cease as well. This wasn't a singular invasion, with an enemy general marching proudly into Babylonian lands. The very few records we have, literally less than ten clear references to the disaster falling upon the Great Empire, paints a picture of the entire world falling upon civilization itself, like a zombie horde or a pack of rabid dogs. One report claims that the city of Nimrud was simultaneously sieged by armies of the Elamites, Kassites, Hurrians, and the specific tribes of the Edomaras, Edashishites, and Samharites, as well as allied foreign contingents. These are not all people who typically work well together, and we have no sense of how this 20-year-long general uprising and campaign was organized. We have no record of Babylon putting up any sort of effective defense at all, just the gradual winking out of the light of civilization, point by point. In the south, the new king of Sealand was either in on the conspiracy or simply taking advantage of an opportunity. About the only thing which survives from the tumultuous wars of Samsudetana's reign is a very fragmentary epic, the only unique literature of the first Sealand dynasty, called the Epic of Gulkashar. Quite a bit is missing, and aside from the fact that Gulkashar and Samsudetana's troops are meeting in a large pitched battle, it's impossible to tell what's going on. We don't even know who wins, though we're pretty sure it was not the Babylonians, since on one hand, this is a Sealand epic, and on the other hand, Samsudetana doesn't seem to have done very much winning at any point in his life. The epic, at least the surviving portions, open at the dawn of a battle which has been arranged by the goddess Ishtar, and standing tall on the battlefield, King Golkashar makes a fantastic little speech. I will roar, and like a dad, I will make clouds. I will darken the day for the troops of Samsudetana. I will defeat their massed body. I will smite them. 
I will scatter their group. I will fill the battlefield with their corpses. I will pluck out the young men. I will crush their eggs. I will destroy their hatchlings and their piglets. I will make their sons clash with a flood. In my roaring, I will beat his young sheep. This is the most readable part of the entire epic, but the rest of the battle seems to follow in a similar style. King Golkashar certainly had an appreciation for the testosterone coursing through his bloodstream. And indeed, just as he promised he would, the Babylonian army is smashed and the city of Nippur recovered, as well as probably quite a lot of southern territory. Either as a result of these consecutive losses, or perhaps part of the initial problem, large chunks of Kassite mercenaries, who had been stationed in the forts that had protected the territory of Babylon for a century, suddenly revolted, and by the year 1600, Faced with revolt on the inside and invasion on the outside, the empire that Hammurabi had built had been reduced to nothing but the capital itself. For five years, the people of Babylon cower beneath their high walls, their empire shattered, their gods absent, surrounded on all sides by the forces of barbarism, fearing the inevitable protracted siege that would spell the end of their civilization. And five years later, in 1595 BCE, the Hittites arrive and burn the city of Babylon to the ground. Wait, the who? Yeah, you, you may have heard of them before, but not in this podcast. The Hittites play absolutely no role in Babylonian history until the day they show up from out of nowhere to annihilate them. The Hittites come from Anatolia and have been building up a little kingdom for a while now, but it's here that they burst onto the world stage. But we're going to save the Hittites for later. For now, it's enough that everything valuable from the city is being carried away back to the capital in Hattusa, both people and possessions, though the people are soon to become possessions themselves, and King Samsudetana perishes with his city. The line of Sumul El is extinguished, and the city of Babylon is so thoroughly destroyed that it will remain an uninhabited ruin for the entire century. So utterly destroyed was the entire region of Babylonia during this disastrous two decades that 100 years later, when Egyptian pharaoh Tutmos I would mount the first Egyptian expedition to Mesopotamia and discover the backwards flowing Euphrates River, his army would march all the way without meeting any substantial civilization until the return journey when he would encounter the Mitanni of Assyria in an encounter which we'll be featuring in some future episode of the show. The Sealand Dynasty too goes quiet at this time. They were always poor and probably now even poorer and without some larger neighbor to record their conflicts the already obscure dynasty will pass the next century in almost total silence for the first time since it arose two thousand years earlier the light of advanced civilization has been snuffed out in mesopotamia completely and the fire that they once spread to their neighbors will not burn there again for another hundred years. But this is not the end of our story. We are, in fact, a very long way from anything like that. Those Hittites I mentioned, they're absolutely fascinating and have a rich enough culture and history that we're going to head westward and play very loose with our definition of Mesopotamian history, bringing Anatolia into play. A bit closer to home, the Mitanni will rise to play a role in northern Mesopotamia, and the Kassites will eventually return to refound the city of Babylon and reforge it into a new kingdom. The cities of Phoenicia, already old by the sack of Babylon, are going to appear more clearly in the historical record, and one particular group is going to found a little kingdom called Israel that will punch above its weight for the rest of human history. The Assyrians will rise, fall, and rise again into the first truly regional empire. And through it all, the great Mesopotamian civilization, now expanded into the entire Near East, will remain endlessly fascinating, with legends and history to keep us going for as long as you care to listen. <laughs> 
but we aren't going to tackle all these things next time. Instead, we're going to go back in time and a little bit north to the city of Asher. Assyria is not the empire that Shamsi Adad had once built it into, and it is not the empire that it will later become. But something interesting is happening in this struggling city, and it will serve as our bridge into later periods and more distant places. So join us next time, as Tiny Asher finally gets tired of getting kicked around and decides to do some kicking of its own, though mostly it just ends up kicking itself. Thank you for listening.